Okay, so it's a pleasure to have Misha looking, uh, give uh, this uh, Paris Rosen uh, Colloquium. That's a special event. Um, so yeah, Misha did, uh, I can't even start saying how many amazing things he did in quantum. So I don't know, anything I'll say probably will do injustice, but you know, it's worked on a wide variety of systems from EIT to, uh, uh, you know, um, color centers in diamond and, uh, um, you know, and now this uh, uh, cold atom, uh, uh, neutral atom uh, quantum simulators and uh, yes, yeah, really amazing stuff. And it's a pleasure to have him here. Thanks, Misha, for uh, joining. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, so much Nathanael. So it's great to see you guys all. So, uh, uh, so I did not quite know how, like how the, you know, what the audience co is going to be. So I will start kind of a little bit, you know, paint you a little bit of a broad picture on the field, but then hopefully zoom in into some of our kind of uh, most recent work. So uh, what um, I'm going to talk today about is uh, kind of what I view is an effort of our community uh, for a quest for controlling quantum world. And in this quest, what we would like to do is we'd like to isolate and control some simple quantum objects. And then once we have them under full control, try to build more and more complex systems from them. And with that, you know, we hope to, you know, study new physics. And this is basically a physics with engineered many body systems, uh, creating and probing new states of matter and hopefully also start exploring new applications. And the new applications is of course the, you know, quantum information processing, communications, metrology, and et cetera. And uh, one interesting thing which one should know before going forward is that despite of the fact that you hear now, of course, a lot about, you know, uh, quantum, and I think this field is actually at the exciting, you know, point, um, as I hope I will convince you, uh, it now has, faces two uh, big, you know, challenges. And one of them is a challenge of uh, scaling up, building really a large scale, you know, quantum systems with uh, which, you know, are still coherent and programmable and things like this. And, you know, we don't really know if we, if and how we can build, for example, machines composed from, I don't know, millions or, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of good qubits. But moreover, even if, you know, I were to build one of these machines and give it, you know, to basically you and you are kind of, you know, already a distinguished audience, you know, of experts, you know, basically it would be hard for you to know what to do with this machine. So this is what I call kind of, uh, you know, an application challenge, you know, you know, what can we use this, you know, quantum machines for? And so basically these are the two kind of, you know, uh, challenges which really, kind of drive which motivate at least a lot of the work that we, the, that we are doing. And, uh, you know, you could also kind of say that, well, there is now a lot of kind of competition between different, you know, um, you know, platforms now between different countries, maybe, you know, you could kind of think about this, you know, qual you know ultimate quantum uh, rivalry, but actually, you know, if, you know, kind of, if you take a step back and really ask a question, what is, you know, what are this, what are this competition, you know, between fundamentally, this is a competition between actually two uh, distinct forces of nature. So uh, one is uh, the force of uh, controllability and another one is a force of scalability. And this is actually something which, uh, you know, is this competition between these two forces is kind of a, a, a central to many areas of human activity, you know, not just quantum physics, you know, but, you know, for example, if you have a, you know, big organization in Israel and, you know, you put a lot of smart, you know, people like, you know, physicists, for example, this organization will be by definition very challenging to control, right? So, and it's, you know, it's like this also in, 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 in quantum physics. So basically, you know, you know, kind of trying to really make, you know, more and more, you know, larger and larger quantum systems wireless at the same time, you know, keep, for example, you know, fidelity of the gates, you know, keep, you know, basically this controllability is, is, is what, you know, one of them, 
kind of uh, outstanding challenges in, in this field. And so basically <clears throat> the current frontiers is that we would like to build machines with systems, you know, sizes, you know, containing more than, you know, let's say 100 good qubits <clears throat> such that they can perform the tasks that classical computers can really not keep up with. And uh, with these kind of machines, what we hope to do is we hope to start thinking about building bigger and better quantum machines. We hope we will discover some new ideas and uncover new principles, which will allow us to scale up. But we can also start asking, you know, what could be useful algorithms and scientific applications, you know, trying to ask to address this apl uh, application challenge. And what I hope to convince you by the end of my talk is we are, and we are already kind of entering, maybe already entered this kind of very interesting kind of land where no one has ever been and where actually whenever you start kind of, you know, trying to do one experiment or another, you know, you are very likely, you know, basically, you know, to discover something, right? And this is what I call the, the age of quantum discovery. So hopefully by the end of my talk, you will be convinced that we are now already in the age of quantum discovery. Okay, so what I'm, am I, I'd like to do today is I'd like to <clears throat> basically uh, uh, talk to you about one group of experiments which is going on uh, in our lab. And this involves building scalable quantum systems using Rydberg atom arrays. You know, I'll show you how we can assemble quantum matter, you know, quantum system atom by atom, and how we can use that uh, system to basically, you know, uh, kind of manipulate, control, entangled atoms. And then as a kind of scientific application, I'll talk about quantum simulations. And in particular, I'll talk about, you know, uh, probing quantum phases and phase transitions in the two-dimensional spin models. And also, you know, kind of in the spirit of the age of quantum discovery, trying to basically, you know, create states and explore states which have so far been inaccessible, you know, either through kind of exact solutions or through numerics. And, one of the examples will be, you know, our recent work on steering quantum entanglement dynamic, dynamics using the so-called many-body scars. And towards the end of my talk, I'll hope I'll, you know, talk a little bit about our most recent work involving, for example, realization of topological spin liquid and also perhaps a little bit of work on what we are doing on quantum optimization. Okay, so we would like in this talk to focus on building quantum processors based on called neutral atoms. And you know, there are many good reasons why you know, this could be a promising system. So for example, you know, uh, uh, neutral atoms uh, can have truly excellent coherence properties. So if, for example, think about you know, the modern optical clocks, which actually make use of you know, uh, neutral atoms. It is also easy to create large number of neutral atoms around us, you know, in each of our room, there is a lot of, you know, atoms and molecules kind of flying around. But, you know, at the same time, there are also challenges. And one of the obvious challenges is that the atoms in the gas phase, phase interact very weakly. Uh, and uh, uh, then in addition, neutral atoms are very hard to control individually, at least in large number. For example, all of these, you know, atoms and molecules, you know, they're flying around rapidly, you know, so in, whereas in principle, there are good, you know, amount, a lot of actually potential qubits, you know, around us, you know, these are clearly not, you know, kind of useful in this way. So motivated by these considerations, a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, started thinking about new ways to kind of build um, scalable quantum systems. And, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, one of these ways involves uh, using uh, the so-called optical tweezers, the so focused beams of light that, the, uh, that um, uh, can attract uh, and, you know, suspend and hold and trap, you know, individual atoms. So what we are doing uh, in our approach is we basically start with the guess of of laser cooled atoms, you know, uh, pre cooled by conventional uh, uh, laser cooling techniques. Uh, and then what we do is we shine this, you know, tightly focused beams of light and we focus these beams, you know, so tightly that kind of basically, you know, each individual tweezer, you know, holds at most uh, 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 one atom. But then we don't start with just one tweezer, we start with a lot of tweezers and basically try to load them all simultaneously. And of course, in such a way, uh, uh, what happens is that the system has some entropy. 
So basically, you know, what when every given attempt, what we find is that some of these uh, tweezers are populated by one atom, but you know, the rest uh, of them are, are empty. So in order to get rid of this entropy, what we literally do is we take a picture of atoms, you know, figure out which traps are full, which are empty, and then just eliminate the empty traps and then rearrange the uh, the, the uh, uh, full traps in a kind of desired configuration as, as shown here. So in this way, we end up with atoms which are sitting a couple of micrometers away from each other. So it's such that this system is completely classical. The atoms are not interacting. So to make the atoms interact, what we do is we excite them into this um, so-called Rydberg states, the states with high principal quantum numbers where they start feeling each other's present. And uh, that's a mechanism which we use for, uh, for entanglement and quantum gates. And this is actually our uh, collaborative project, project with the groups of uh, Markus Greiner and Waden Wulitich within our Harvard um, MIT Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. So, this is <clears throat> the schematic of the first generation of our experimental system. The central element here is this so called acoustic optic deflector. So, this is basically the element where we take the laser beam. Uh, uh, and, and put it into this device. And then, you know, we add the number of radio frequency tones. And then for each tone, this acoustic optic deflector deflects uh, the incoming laser beam. And so that way we basically create an array of these uh, laser beams, which we then project. And then that's how we can, you know, trap uh, uh, the atoms. And then, for example, if you want to remove one empty trap, what you do, you just remove one tone. Or if you want to move the trap, you just, you know, chop the frequency of this RF, you know, and that way um, uh, the beams will be steered, the beams will, will uh, uh, move. So this is also a kind of almost historical, you know, picture actually of the first generation of students and postdocs who built uh, the system. So many of them already went on to become, you know, big professors on their own actually. Uh, three of them are still around, and actually Alex and Harry are two students. You know, one of them just graduated last week, and another one is graduating next next week. So it's a big kind of you know generation change here. And Julie is still also with us as a postdoc. So uh, okay, so let me talk a little bit more <clears throat> about uh, the interaction. So basically, as I mentioned, what uh, uh, we do is you know we use lasers, you know, uh, finely tuned lasers to excite the atoms from the ground state into the Rydberg states with, uh, uh, with large N. And we basically make use of the fact that um, uh, in this kind of systems with large uh, N, the atoms have long lifetimes and strong interactions. And uh, uh, in fact, you know, this effect is quite dramatic, the interaction effect. So, for example, if you go to n equals 100, then the atoms in these uh, two Rydberg states uh, have van der Waal interaction, which is 14 orders of magnitude stronger than the ground state atoms, you know. And so these 14 orders of magnitude is a large number, and we can make a good use of that. So, specifically, if you try to drive the atoms uh, resonantly, uh, uh, then if they are far away, they will just undergo conventional radio oscillations. But if you bring them close, what will happen is that at some point, this interaction will take over. And as a result, you know, what will happen is that, you know, past certain distance, which we call the Rydberg blockade, the, uh, you will have a situation where you will be able to excite every one of the two atoms, but never both of them simultaneously. So this is the effect which we called which we call Rydberg blockade. And basically this Rydberg blockade prohibits simultaneous excitation uh, at distances smaller than this blockade radius. And it turns out to be a kind of a very good, very robust effect for entangling atoms because it's insensitive to motion, position, and, and et cetera uh, of, of, of the atom. So in, in short, <coughs> sorry. What we are going to do uh, in our experiments is we will first you know, assemble the desired atomic configuration. Uh, and then we'll shine some pulses of lasers into that. And that, you know, afterwards, we will just basically make a projective readout of this um, 
uh, of this atomic uh, state, determining which internal state at the end the atom is. So, and you know, basically, you know, there are kind of wide variety of directions where we cannot, you know, take this experiment. So, actually, what I will focus mostly uh, in this talk is on the idea of programmable quantum simulators, and this was the very first idea that Feynman put forward, which stimulated the development of quantum computers. And the statement there is that if you basically have just n, you know, quantum uh, bits, for example, and you want to model the system, then, uh, for example, studying its dynamics, then you know you have to solve the solution to a ten, two to the n coupled, you know, uh, equations, and actually it becomes, you know, exponentially hard very quickly. And alternatively, what one could do is one could basically implement the model of this interacting uh, system on this programmable quantum simulator where you have a standard set of, for example, qubits with programmed interaction. And it's exactly this kind of model, which I will. Uh, Qubit states will... are, are uh, hyperfine states? So these states can be either hyperfine states or it can be ground and Rydberg states. So we have a choice, oh, you know? So in fact, throughout most, uh, throughout of these talks, I will mostly talking uh, talk about encoding in ground and Rydberg. Uh, manifold. But again, it will be two specific hyper one hyperfine state of ground state and one state of the Thank you. So from this point of view of uh, uh, kind of uh, you know programmable quantum simulators, we can think about um, our you know uh, atom array, you know, in this, for example, case atom chain as a spin model. And uh, kind of a spin model, uh, we can describe it by this Hamiltonian. So it's kind of an Ising type spin model. So, and you know, to basically give you a little bit of intuition, let me just you know talk about um, the phase diagram of this model. You know, now in one special dimension. So this actually problem has been studied by our condensed matter colleague Subir Sajdi a few years ago. And this spin model can be understood in terms of two parameters. One of them is this uh, laser detuning. So this laser detuning basically just it's a detuning from the two photon transition acts uh, as a kind of chemical potential. So if uh, we focus on this term, then you know clearly when the detuning is negative, it would favor all atoms to be in the ground state. If this detuning is positive, it will favor all atoms to be in the excited state. However, you know, uh, this uh, situation changes when you turn on the interactions. And in particular, for example, if you uh, have these blockade interactions between nearest neighbor, clearly you will not be able to access a state like this. So the only state that you can access is when every one, every other atom is excited. So this is an anti-ferromagnetic type state. So the state with Z2 uh, symmetry uh, uh, broken. Um, and that's indeed the state which will be a ground state, you know, when you kind of turn interactions and its interaction is, you know, uh, basically blocks the nearest neighbor. But if you increase the interaction range, what will happen then is that you will be able to also block the second nearest neighbor, the third nearest neighbor, and then you basically create the series of these, you know, different states. And uh, basically in our uh, experiments, we can, you know, explore all of this uh, phase diagram, basically almost kind of instantaneously, by simply uh, just changing the position, the distance between uh, the atoms, or by changing which Rydberg state we excite to, right? So, and one uh, possibility is that we just initially prepare, you know, the system with all atoms in the ground state, and then just adiabatically enter, you know, uh, um, change the detuning to enter these ordered phases for different effective interaction energy. So this is uh, perhaps one of our first kind of images, you know, here uh, taken with the system. So here, what we do is we just start with atoms, which are, you know, reasonably far away. And then, you know, if it is 13 atom system and then basically enter this, you know, anti-ferromagnetic state, you see that every other atom here is excited. And um, indeed, you know, you could, you know, uh, uh, see this kind of ordering, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down. So here is, you know, there is a kind of, there is some competition between these orders. You basically kind of, it's almost like a real, you know, picture of the phase transition. But, you know, of course, what you could do, simply you could bring the atoms closer together. And here, for example, you know, both nearest and second nearest neighbor is blocked. So you have up, down, down, up, down, down, etc. And, you know, here is a state also with Z3 symmetry broken. So basically what you see is that, 
you know, we can easily program effectively interactions, you know, between the atoms. And, you know, in this case, it is a, results in um, a desired uh, breaking of the seed. And so now... Uh, physical distance between the atoms? Yeah. What's the actual distance between the atoms? It, it is typically a few micrometers. So here, you know, it's probably I, it's definitely maybe six micrometers or something. So it's maybe changes here from kind of, you know, kind of six, eight micrometers to like, you know, two, three micrometers or something like that, you know? So this, uh, but, you know, they are, you know, they are very well, you know, beyond kind of diffraction limit, right? Because that's important. And, you know, I mean, typically the interactions you know, we, we can, you know, do very robust kind of engineering of interactions up to maybe, you know, like 10, even 15 uh, 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 micrometers, you know. We can even do it, we have done experiments with, you know, even longer range, strong interactions, but, you know, it's, you know, it's a little bit more challenging, but, you know, but, you know, there is a kind of enormous range in which you can play. That's, that's, that's a special feature. And the measurement is just a photoluminescence of the ground state? Yeah, the 40, exactly. So what we do for the measurements is actually, it's typically destructive measurement. So what we do is we, you know, after the sequence, we, you know, push the Rydberg atoms uh, uh, kind of away and then capture the, uh, the ground state atoms and just take a picture. So this is what you see is ground state atoms and missing atoms are Rydberg atoms. Thank you. And do you see in each run uh, the symmetry breaking at different points or uh, it, it always has uh, the same points are uh, turning so, on? So for this specific image, you know, this is a relatively small system and uh, of 13 atoms. And here edge effects, they pin the zona, right? But, you know, of course, you know, for example, if you have instead, you know, even number of atoms, or if you have larger systems, you know, or if you will see now in a second in 2D, you know, you certainly, you see, you very much see the symmetry, but you can see these two patterns alternating and we actually make use of that. So let me just kind of give you a little bit. So these results are now by now a few years old. So, you know, and uh, there were uh, kind of a number of experiments we have done with one dimensional system. So for example, we have, uh, done, you know, high fidelity entanglement and actually demonstrated parallel multi-qubit uh, gate operations. Uh, and in this case, we use the hyperfine encoding of atoms. Also in this uh, kind of 1D system, you know, uh, with system sizes up to 50 or so atoms, we actually studied phase transitions. We could, for example, look at, you know, uh, different types of ordering, you know, and uh, 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 you know, look, for example, kind of dynamics of the domain, uh, uh, domain walls. So we studied non-equilibrium dynamics, pushing system far away from equilibrium uh, and, you know, uh, exploring what, you know, how it evolves. And this is when we discovered this something which is called many body quantum scars. I will talk a little bit about it later. And actually, this is maybe the answer to your, to your point. So this, you know, so here in the system size up to 20 or so atoms, we were not just able to kind of see that, you know, you have this two, you know, up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, up, you know, states occur, but we also were able to verify that we actually prepare a coherent superposition of the states. So that way we were able to generate this, uh, what's called Schrodinger cat states. And actually, you know, this, you know, up to 20 or so atoms, actually up to maybe a month ago, it was the largest Schrodinger cat state you know, people have created of this variety. So actually now there is some uh, kind of new kind of results, a few more atoms. But anyway, so basically what you see is that these directions are very closely connected and they all involve this kind of coherent high fidelity analog of digital uh, 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 kind of evolution. Are you going to talk more about this large scale entanglement? Uh, I was wondering just what's the life, what the coherence kind of time of these uh, yeah. angle states. Yeah, the co you know, yeah, it's a good, so the coherence time uh, of these, you know, scat states was a kind of in a microsecond um, uh, domain. So the main sources of the coherence, uh, you know, in our systems are actually kind of maybe threefold. 
So one is that there is some you know, spontaneous emission, uh, both from Rydberg states and also from intermediate states. We have you know, multi-photon excitation, which you know, uh, play a role. So the other thing is that actually, and maybe it is I should have mentioned, so typically when we, uh, when we drive the atoms to the Rydberg uh, states, we usually uh, switch off the traps. And uh, the reason why we do it is because basically, you know, the trapping potentials are actually different from ground state and excited state atoms. And actually, moreover, for the states we work with, you know, the ground state atom is even kind of repelled by this, you know, weakly repelled by the trap. So, and, um, and then what happens is because our atoms, you know, have finite temperature, eventually this kind of, they start moving and, and flying kind of around. So that sets our, you know, coherence times now, in some maybe tens of microseconds or, 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 or so. But, you know, of course we can do these operations. Typically we, we complete all operations, you know, all it was experiments within, you know, maybe two, three microseconds. So we never run into, into this kind of decoherence typically, but of course, once you have a large, you know, cat state, you know, then it will, it will decohere, right? Can I ask how much decoherence is introduced by the tweezers? It actually, uh, in the in the scenario which I just described, where we turn off the tweezers during the during the coherent evolution, there is by definition none, right? Uh, because we just we have we turn them off. So it turns out that you don't need to turn them off. We did experiments where we had tweezers on, and then it is actually. You know, uh, you know, they typically the, these experiments are, you know, perform worse, right? Because, you know, I mean, you, you have an homogeneous, you know, light shifts and so on, but you also, you just repel the excited state atoms, right? But still you could do, you could see, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's reasonable, but you know, it basically under current conditions, it's better to turn the traps off, you know. So, okay, any other questions about kind of the basics? It's good that people ask it. All right, so let me then kind of maybe move on a little bit and, you know, so basically, okay, it was the work, you know, up to about last year. So early last year, we kind of implemented a major upgrade uh, and uh, since when we are, are, you know, running what we call um, uh, second generation with array. So this second generation is uh, uh, powered by this device, which is called spatial light modulator. So it's basically a computer generated hologram, you know, where we now can create two dimensional uh, uh, kind of arrangements. Uh, and uh, um, of beams and, you know, we can create easily this kind of, you know, uh, beam patterns with thousands of, of, of traps. Uh, now this uh, kind of this SLM is actually is a great device, but it's slow. So to, in order to sort atoms, we still use uh, acoustic optic deflectors. And actually we now use a, a pair of crossed EODs such that we can basically move the atoms, the rows and columns of, 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 of atoms. And so this is all, you know, computer control. And then of course, you know, uh, one other thing which happened over last year, and this is why now we're all sitting in our, you know, homes or you know, maybe some people in offices. So basically, uh, about a year ago, so uh, uh, due to pandemic, we basically had to shut down the lab. And in a week leading to this, you know, historical day, March 17, we basically were able to convert our entire experiment uh, into this, what we call server mode, such that we can be run remotely. So this is a new generation of uh, students and postdocs or some here of them on Zoom. So basically everything what I'll show from uh, now on, all the data which I'll show from now on were taken remotely. So, uh, okay. So this is kind of first, you know, um, uh, just some simple images, you know, how we are trying to sort the atoms. So we here start with something like 600 uh, 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 atoms and then, we basically, you know, uh, try to, you know, create arrays of maybe 300 or so atoms, right? And so this is some, you know, of the uh, kind of uh, 
image is not quite real time. So they are, you know, a little bit slowed down. I think kind of zoom actually cannot handle, you know, the these things kind of fast enough. So, and moreover, it sometimes freezes now. So let's see how it will work. <laughs> so, um, but what you see is that basically we can create with reasonable fidelity, this kind of, uh, Arrays of you know uh, up to 300 atoms, so each traps we filled with with more than 99 percent uh, 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 probability, and um, you know sometimes, for example, you know we have this perfect defect free free 300 atom array, but maybe what's more exciting is we can also generate all of these kind of different geometries, you know, square, tilted square, triangular, hexagonal, kagame, and. Uh, uh, moreover, we can create arbitrary patterns. For example, here is a pattern we would like, and here is a pattern which we generate. Okay, so what do we should we do with this, you know, uh, systems? And of course, the first thing that what we would like to do is basically would like to do quantum simulations. And you know, the easiest thing would be to just generalize the kind of uh, these considerations that I told you about one dimension to two dimensional system. Again, this is our system Hamiltonian. And we can ask what will be the ground state of this Hamiltonian. For example, if you have nearest neighbor blockade, just nearest neighbor interaction. So clearly what will happen in this case is that you will have an anti-ferromagnetic, you know, type, you know, a phase, uh, which actually in this case we called, uh, we call checkerboard phase. So transition into the state will be actually two plus one D uh, Ising phase transition. Uh, which is, you know, paradigmatic phase transition, but ap apparently it turns out up to now it hasn't been observed. <coughs> but um, moreover, you know, what we can do is we can actually now try to change the range of interactions. And once we start changing the range, there is a zoo of all kind of exotic phases and actually it turns out that there is a quite complicated phase diagram. So it's actually was worked out by uh, Ryan, uh, one of the Subir Sajdiv students about a year. Ago. So basically, we can now access all of these complex phases and, you know, we can study this phase transition. And as I said, that even this kind of 2D Ising quantum phase transition has never been observed. So can we try to observe it? Uh, yes, we can just again prepare our system in the ground state in this kind of square array, or arrange the blockade radius appropriately, and then just try to do this kind of adiabatic sweep. And, you know, we uh, very nicely um, find the this uh, 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 kind of anti-ferromagnetic ordering. So, and, uh, 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 you know, now we can, you know, go ahead and just uh, uh, study this. And actually I should say that there is also very nice work by uh, Antoine's group. And Antoine is of course here on the, uh, um, uh, on the call here, uh, also demonstrating, you know, things like this. But, you know, this is just one image, of course, you know, uh, as you know, like, you know, this order is not always perfect. So we can characterize this order in several different ways. So one is we could look at uh, uh, correlation function. So uh, basically this is kind of a second order uh, correlation function. There we should see this up, down, up, down, up, down correlations. And indeed we do. And we see that this correlation spread across the entire array. <coughs> But moreover, we could also look at the system microscopically and, for example, analyze the probability of various states which occur. And actually, uh, uh, it turns out that the most probable states are these uh, states, you know, uh, which uh, have this checkerboard ordering. And indeed, these are two complementary states, as similar to, to the question what was asked. And in this case, we see that, you know, you have two patterns which are kind of complementary to each other. And we can even ask a question, you know, what is the probability that this specific, you know, one of these two specific patterns, you know, appears. And actually it turns out that if we scale the array size, the probability actually decreases exponentially, uh, but it decreases exponentially as 0.97 to the power of n. So basically, so from here we could, you know, conclude that correlations extend across the entire array there is a substantial probability of this perfect order in the, you know, array up to, you know, something like 256 atoms. And that we have this, you know, kind of free probability uh, per atom error for during the entire, basically, duration, including kind of everything. So and that's actually that way we can start benchmarking our system. So what's the effective temperature of, the, of these pins if you convert it to temperature? 
uh, in, in the final state? In the final state? And you have some entropy, right? Because you, you're not in the ground state. Ooh, I guess we are not typically thinking about, well, I mean, okay, first off, typically when we start analyzing the temperature, we always find that we do not create thermal states. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So right. that's why we are kind of, <clears throat> and look, this, you know, this 3% probability, it includes, for example, quantum fluctuations as well, right? right. Yeah. We are not, we should not be actually in a perfect, you know, I mean, because we don't yet sort of our basis is a little bit tilted. So, so uh, that's why I think this question about this temperature here is will be kind of hard to answer. But one, what, what we could do is we could uh, try to dynamically explore how correlations grow. So that's maybe a little bit better way to kind of characterize, you know, what's going on. And that's actually how we, can really, you know, explore this, you know, quantum phase transition. So uh, specifically what we do here is the following. So <clears throat> basically we can cross the phase transition at different speed. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, depending on how fast we cross, we create different uh, uh, number of excitations. So here you could in the Kibble Zurich sense speak about temperature. But you could also kind of, you know, basically, add, you know, one way to characterize it is to look at, you know, uh, at the correlation length, right? So basically, if you go across a phase transition fast, then your correlation length is very short. But if you go slowly, your, your, your correlation length is basically extends over the entire array. So, and, you know, using that, you can, for example, look at <clears throat> how correlation length grows, right? Depending on speed and depending on where you, you stop. And you know, uh, what you could now do is one could use this concept of universality, basically close to phase transition. You know, if you rescale this, uh, this uh, uh, curves appropriately, you know, all of them you know, should collapse. And then from there, you can try to extract, for example, things like critical exponents. And this is indeed what we have done. So we kind of by rescaling it with this speed, you know, uh, we were able to actually, you know, and basically finding the optimal rescaling, we were able to extract a critical exponent. So actually specifically, I must say for this experiment, we fixed dynamical critical exponent to one and extracted new. Mm -hmm. And uh, this new, you can actually extract by just optimizing data collapse with the kind of second digit. And then actually it is a kind of a remarkable agreement with a prediction for the quantum phase transition. And the system cannot anneal after you cross. I mean, there's no way for the system to anneal after you cross the phase transition, right? Yeah, it you know, <clears throat> it is not. It's decoupled from environment, yeah. right? But of course, it can anneal sort of within itself, yeah. right? It can thermalize, <clears throat> right? And it's actually, in fact, it turns out that these processes are kind of subtle, right? So that's why you know. And that's why we use this specific method. So <clears throat> in this method, we actually cross and then just stop, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, and kind of and do this rescaling because if you start, for example, you start waiting and so on, it kind of affects the dynamics a little bit, you know? But it is not, you know, it is, you know, isolated system, right? So, okay, so, you know, using this type of things, we can really basically, you know, study phase transitions. And in fact, as, you know, according to Subir, at least that's the first observation of uh, Ising quantum phase transition in two plus one dimension. And it's actually, we can also benchmark um, this quantum many body dynamics. Okay, so kind of with these uh, kind of tools, you know, over the last, you know, year or so, we actually had a lot of fun, you know, still have a lot of fun exploring different aspects. So we can, for example, look at some of these more exotic phases in 2D. Uh, uh, we could look at uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. You know, we can, we as, you know, kind of talked in, in the beginning, we started to study topological phases and we're actually also exploring this application to combinatorial optimization. So I don't think, you know, I have time to kind of discuss all of this, but I'll give you a little sampling. You know, maybe, you know, talk about two or maybe three, you know, topics, but maybe it's not a good point to, kind of slow down, kind of, and, you know, ask if there are any questions. 
I have a question. When you do the sorting and your arrangement, do you need to apply some kind of cooling? And how sensitive you are um, to the distribution of these atoms? I mean, how far are they from the ground state, etc.? And how? Yeah. So, so we, you know, you know, we typically, you know, um, uh, you know, so. So, so in our okay, so in our case, you know, we just kind of load the atom atoms exactly directly from the mod, and so and uh, so the atoms are not in a ground motion state. So in principle, uh, we know how to cool the atoms in the to the close to the ground motional state uh, by using Raman cooling. And we actually, we've even done it. We have this system in our setup, but for most experiments, we don't, uh, we don't use, uh, we don't use them so far. You know, we just didn't find that it's helpful. You know, but you know, as we kind of try to improve fidelity, you know, we will, you know, uh, uh, we we will probably start using it more and more often. So right now, the it is our understanding that we are mostly limited, you know, by our vacuum. We have about 10 second lifetime, vacuum lifetime. And this is what limits our... Uh, uh, okay, kind of lifetimes and so on. So... Can you individually somehow, you know, control, um, say, the coupling between those Spins kind of on a, on a say bond, you know, change the different bonds. Yeah. So right now, okay, the the uh, what you have seen now in this in the data that I've shown, we have global excitation to the Rydberg states. We have individual preparation and readout. We also, you know, have a possibility to individually address each given atom. Or we can address also, uh, you know, like uh, patterns of atoms. What we do not have yet is a possibility to basically in parallel address all atoms, uh, like at a large scale, at a scale more than, I don't know, you know, few, you know. We are working on that, you know, and that's, I'm sure this will come online, but it's not completely trivial. But for example, for these things like gates, you know, we were able to address, we can address, for example, every second atom or every third atom, you know, these things we already have, you know. So and typically we do it by creating light shifts. Uh, on, on the... You can also imprint the phase and mm -hmm. kind of a relative phase. On the yeah, top. we can also control in principle, we can imprint, we can imprint a phase. Yeah, we can in principle do this. So usually, yeah, so usually, like if you do this individual addressing, you know, uh, like the, the relative phase between addressing beams does not matter because sort of each atom has its own, if you want, kind of phase, kind of clock, right? But, you know, but of course, if you sort of, if you started it and then you start changing the phase, you can create gradient and so on. And that's, that's totally doable, yeah. Yeah, actually, that we can do right. We can do it now. We have done it actually already in some experiments. Yeah. Can you explain again how do you do, say, control not or control Z between, uh, say, next nearest neighbors or third nearest neighbors or even nearest neighbors? Yeah, so the way how we <clears throat> implement this kind of universal gates is we encode the qubits in the hyperfine states. And then what we do is basically, you know, we excite, you know, one. Uh, hyperfine state uh, into the Rydberg state. And that way we switch on this kind of Ising type interaction. And this way we can use it to uh, create this control phase gate. So that's how that's how it's implemented. And so the, only the atoms which are excited in the Rydberg state will you know, undergo this dynamic. So that way we can, in fact, <clears throat> we can, you know, you know, we can create, you know, we can execute these gates, you know, across, you know, almost across the entire array, actually, you know, just by exciting a desired pair. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, you know, now, 
the question you need to do it in a robust way and so on and so on, but you know, which is, you know, like the original gate ideas are now almost 20 years old, you know, but, um, and, but so for example, some of the things which we thought about 20 years old, we could really not solve some of this problem with kind of new generation, you know, as very clever people, they come with some new ideas, which actually really, could, you know, qualitative improvement, some of these things. Okay, so let me give you just a little, some, maybe I will just talk about two um, kind of directions. So one of them is, um, uh, you know, direction, which I think, you know, is particularly exciting because that's where, you know, it's, you know, classical computers really have hard time, you know, you know, simulating this kind of systems is basically taking the systems out of equilibrium. And so, and this is related to the story of many body scars. So this is literally one of the very first experiments we have done once we got one dimensional array working. So what we have done is we basically prepared this anti-ferromagnetic state through this adiabatic, you know, uh, protocol. And uh, so this is up, down, up, down, up, down state. But then instead of stopping here, what we have done is basically we've done this kind of quench experiment where we basically change the detuning just across the phase transition. And the idea at the time was to try to basically see how system formalizes. And indeed we saw you know, initially that you know, these correlations up down, up down correlations disappear. But then if we waited a little bit longer, they reappeared. And then we waited a little bit longer, they disappeared and then reappeared. And you see that the system kind of lives its own life. So, um, and we were actually quite confused. We initially thought it's a finite size effect, but then we tried to basically go to larger and larger system and it's still these oscillations, you know, persisted. So um, uh, this was quite puzzling. So at the time when we kind of, you know, uh, submitted this first, you know, uh, paper uh, 2017, we did not really know what was going on. So we had some kind of ideas where even, you know, matrix product state kind of dynamics uh, simulations, which we produced our experimental results, but really the, the origin of those was not clear. And that stimulated, you know, theorists to really think about different approaches. And there was one of these approaches, which actually I like very much, I'd like to explain briefly, is related to uh, the concept of quantum scars. And I think in Technion, you know, I think there are some, you know, quantum chaos uh, community, which actually I remember from old days, so you guys might enjoy it. So basically, for those of you who don't remember what it quantum scars or don't know, it's basically a concept from the kind of uh, single particle quantum chaos. So if you look at something like a billiard, you know, a chaotic, you know, uh, system, typically, you know, uh, such a system will have a few, you know, a small number, a few closed trajectories, like the ones shown here. Those trajectories are typically unstable. So, I mean, that's a definition of chaotic system, right? And you could say, well, okay, now what if you quantize it, you know, would these trajectories, you know, leave any kind of trace after quantization naively due to uncertainty relations, maybe they should, they should not, but actually in practice, it turns out that, you know, in many cases they do. So, and this is this uh, uh, eigenstate, you know, uh, quantum eigenstate relate, uh, resembling this classical trajectory. So this was actually discovered by our chemistry colleague, Eric Heller. So, and this was named uh, uh, quantum scar. So, uh, I'm so sorry, something, uh, something on my screen, just one second. Okay, so, um, uh, and basically what um, the kind of a group of theorists, you know, uh, kind of, you know, Dima uh, Abanian and Maxim uh, Serbin, you know, pointed out is that, you know, uh, perhaps what we observe here is a many body version of the, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this, of this scar. So in what way? Well, uh, you can think about that in terms of the, uh, the, uh, kind of eigenstates of the system. So basically, it turns out in this system, most of the eigenstates form this kind of chaotic continuum, but there is this set, finite set of eigenstates, which have this kind of, which are separated from the rest, which form this kind of periodic, you know, set of states, you know, which cause these oscillations, persistent oscillations. So which are basically non-ergodic, kind of, you know, they are this scared, scarred eigenstate. 
states, but you can also think about this in terms of this matrix product state, and that's actually maybe more of a quantum classical correspondence. So basically, we can parameterize the dynamics by one dimension two MPS, and then there is a closed trajectory, unstable trajectory in this parameter space, which is exactly the trajectory which we observe. So basically, this is kind of like, it turns out to be an exciting direction, you know, and in fact, still there is, you know, almost a paper a week, you know, with kind of new explanation, new view, it's related to latest gauge theories, you know, all sorts of, you know, cool things. And actually, you know, in our group, you know, Hannes and, and Sun Won were, you know, two kind of theories who really kind of led, you know, understanding of that. So now we could say, okay, we have now can extend the menu of our systems. We can go to a two uh, D uh, lattices, you know, would 2D lattices also uh, support quantum scars? And uh, it's actually, you know, uh, can be easily probed, you know, uh, in a wide variety of lattices. And the idea is that, again, you create antiferromagnetic state and then you quench your detuning and then just see what comes out. And the effect is actually quite dramatic. So suppose, so in this case, I think it's a honeycomb lattice, or uh, maybe, you know, hexagonal and honeycomb lattice, you know, so what, you know, you do you basically prepare antiferromagnetic state here, it's a bipartite lattice, and then you do this quench, and then, you know, you wait, and then basically, you know, all of this order disappears, but you wait a little bit more, the order then appears, you know, again, you know, uh, you wait, it disappears, and then the original order appears. So, this is, you know, basically kind of turns out a feature of, you know, you know, basically of almost all bipartite systems, which we have tried, so they support this uh, many body scars, and now we can really explore their behavior. You know, we can study their stability, we can look at different kind of limits, and, and, and so on. And then we decided, again, in the spirit of this kind of, you know, age of discovery, try to try one um, additional thing. And um, so uh, we decided to try to see if we can actually uh, stabilize these scars with periodic driving. And the idea here is that instead of just um, uh, quenching to the finite detuning, uh, you quench to the detuning where you actually, you know, change this detuning in time. And, uh, you know, it's a, why would you even do it? You know, usually kind of you start driving many body system, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, system should hit. But actually, you know, it turns out that there are examples, and one of the examples is a so-called time crystals where this, you know, heating can be suppressed and instead, the system kind of, you know, revives with the period, which is multiple period of the driving. So uh, here is an example where, you know, first we just quench to the fixed detuning. So there is this kind of scar trajectory, which decays. But now if we, you know, uh, uh, quench to the detuning, which varies in time, what we see this kind of collapses uh, and revivals, you know, dramatically enhanced. And this actually, uh, uh, this kind of enhancement is really due to this periodic driving. In fact, you know, we have an extension of lifetime by a factor of five, but moreover, the frequency locks to this half of the driving frequency. And this is typically a very much kind of a signature of this kind of time crystalline order. So we see it, you know, for many, for different varieties, you know, of, of the experiments. And actually this effect is really quite robust. So uh, I don't really have time to talk too, too much about this kind of um, the origin of that, but basically just to make a long story short, it is now our understanding that this effect is indeed can be viewed as a kind of many body echo, robust many body echo, and it's indeed, you know, kind of appears to be related to this time crystalline kind of uh, order, which however, only exists for the scarring states. And, you know, we basically see it, you know, in a wide variety of uh, parameter regimes, you know, we see it for different kind of, you know, changes in lattices and, and different driving frequencies. And, you know, what's actually most important is that it's really, it's a many body effect. You need to have a linear dimension of the system, at least of the kind of in the range of 10 to really Kind of enable this robustness and you know i think that's kind of really points out that this is a special time so-called prefermal um, type crystal time crystalline uh, response but actually there is something which i would like to show you and it's something actually quite cool so basically so here is you know i think some of the first kind of you know images where you can really see 
their system, in this case, is a nine-atom nine, nine atom chain, you know, the dynamics, you basically, the entire Hilbert space. So what we here plot is basically, we plot the population of all kind of relevant, you know, many body, you know, microstates. And, you know, there are two cases here is a bear and a driven uh, system. And uh, what you know, you'll see if you look at these kind of graphs carefully is that, you know, actually this driving not only extends the lifetime of the driven system, but it also alters the trajectory. And it alters the trajectories in such a way that entanglement in this driven system grows much more slowly compared to the bear system. And, you know, I think this is kind of, it's very cool. It really shows that but you can, by driving system, you can steer entanglement uh, dynamics. So we are quite exciting, excited about actually exploring various type of consequences of this. Okay, so that was one example. I mean, I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> so I think, I, I mean, you usually go over a bit of time, so I'm, I'm happy. Okay, to so let me then give, so I will give you the most kind of, one more example and then I will, you know, uh, so. So I, I will talk now about some of the most recent work that we have done in which we kind of started looking at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, phases in, in the so-called frustrated lattices. And uh, that's actually related to one kind of important uh, subject in condensed matter physics, you know, which is called topological phases uh, of matter or the so-called spin liquids. So, so this spin liquid is a kind of an emergent phenomena in frustrated system and basically it originates due to the following. So suppose you have an antiferromagnetic system, for example, on triangular lattice, you know, and so if you, you know, system is antiferromagnetic, if this spin is up, this should be down, but where do you put this third spin? Should it be up or down? So basically you don't know, the system is frustrated. And this was kind of the motivation, you know, already almost 50 years ago for people like Anderson to start kind of thinking about the phenomenon on spin liquids. So basically these spin liquids are this kind of strongly correlated, you know, entangled soups of, 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 of spins, uh, which are often, you know, uh, kind of expressed in the languages of resonating valence bonds and, 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 and things like this. So, uh, this is actually an exciting kind of direction, you know, uh, in condensed matter physics and people are really basically searching for these states already, you know, for, for, for several decades. But so far there is no con conclusive experimental evidence in any uh, system of this variety. About 20 years ago, Kitaev pointed out that states like this can be useful for topological quantum computation. And this is the idea this idea of fault tolerant quantum computation, where you basically, you know, create this kind of topological uh, order, which can be expressed in terms of this, uh, you know, uh, this so-called loop, you know, uh, loops, uh, the state that you create is eigenstate of the so-called uh, so X and Z loops. I will explain them in, in, in a second. So basically, you know, this kind of, you know, spin liquids or the story code in particular can be viewed as this, you know, Guess of this topological, you know, string operators or topological loop, you know, of, of operators. So, uh, about a year ago, uh, um, you know, two of uh, uh, our condensed matter colleagues, Subir and, and Ashwin, started looking about into, you know, possibility of creating this kind of spin liquid states in our Rydberg atom race, and actually they came up with two. Uh, you know, very cool proposals, you know, and um, I will report and actually we've, we've you know, studied now both of those systems. So I will actually focus today on this so-called Ruby lattice, you know, uh, 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 proposal. And this is actually due to uh, Ashwin Mishwana and uh, Ruben Versin as one of his postdocs. So, uh, okay, so what's the idea then? So the idea is the following. So let's consider the system where uh, we place atoms on the link of this so-called Kagame lattice. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, if you adjust the Rydberg blockade uh, properly, uh, what happens is that you create a, a, a ground state, uh, which is highly degenerate kind of mixture, you know, of all sorts of, you know, possibilities, you know, in terms of Rydberg excitation. So specifically, let's, you know, um, um, 
a just blockade radius such that for each atom, you know, it's six nearest neighbors are blockaded. So what it means at maximum, you can, under these blockade conditions, you should uh, have a feeling of one quarter. So, and then, you know, it turns out that you can actually formally map this kind of model into uh, a class of the so-called dimer model. So basically, you know, for each Rydberg atom, you, you can draw a dimer which lives on this link. And the state that, you know, uh, one could create, you know, by, for example, trying to kind of go into the ground state of this model is the state illustrated here. Now, this is real experimental data uh, where basically you have this kind of dimer covering, you know, which kind of covers this lattice. So what spin liquid? Spin liquid turns out to be a coherent superposition of all of these dimer coverings. So that's what we would like to now show. We would like to now show that we create such states, but it's actually very challenging because you know this, you know, you know, in each shot of the experiment, you will get basically a picture like this. Right? And you cannot, by definition, this is a topological order, you cannot reveal it by using any kind of local observable. So how can we detect study such topological order? So in order to do that, you know, so we uh, follow the kind of approach similar to uh, we have done previously. So we basically prepare the states, kind of we call it quasi adiabatically. And, you know, we can, for example, measure the, uh, the occupation. And indeed what we uh, see is that, you know, when basically we approach this one quarter feeling, something happens, you know, there is a kind of some, you know, plateauing, it's not a perfect plateau, but, you know, there is some kind of kink here. Uh, but, you know, how do you know if the system is ordered or not? You know, in each shot, you get an image, you know, uh, and it's really not so clear. So basically, what we uh, then uh, do is we go back to this kind of idea which I already showed for the toric code. We know that the toric code is an eigenstate of the this so-called string or loop operators, where, which are basically the product in a toric code of Z operators and of uh, or living you know, on this type of loops and X operators living on this type of loops. So we would like to measure these topological operators. And one type of this operator is actually very easy to measure, it turns out. So one of them is the so-called diagonal string operator. So suppose you draw the string, which basically goes, you know, which crosses perpendicular to the links of the Kagame lattice, like shown here. So in the perfect dimer covering where, you know, one dimer should touch each vertex, right? It's our one quarter of feeling, right? What will happen in this case, you know, when you go around one vertex, you know, the, 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 uh, you will always basically um, touch one Rydberg atom. And for a Rydberg atom, you basically assign a parity minus one, for atom in the ground state, you assign a parity plus one. And so the parity of the string will be negative. If you now go for a larger loop, then what will happen is just use the same argument. You can convince yourself that, you know, the expected parity will be minus one to the number of enclosed vertices. And so that way we can really, you know, quantify, you know, how good is our dimer covering. Perfect dimer covering should have basically, you know, this parity, you know, spread across the entire array. So here is our measurement. So basically, you know, uh, uh, and this is a measurement now for two uh, uh, different loops, you know, initially, you know, the, you know, like in disordered phase, you know, both of them have a similar parity, but then you enter the ordered phase and what you see is that they two, you, you, yeah, they develop really the opposite parity. And actually, if you look at various type, type of loops, here is what we observe. Indeed, we observe this kind of parity of this, you know, a string, which is basically, uh, non-zero, you know, for loops, even comparable to the size of the entire array. Well, for larger, for larger um, uh, loops, of course, it kind of grow, uh, goes down and I will discuss it in a sec, uh, uh, why. So by using this kind of approach, we can really convince ourselves that we are making a transition into some kind of dimer phase. But now, 
what we have to do next is we have to show that we create really a superposition of all of these different uh, coherent superposition of all of these different dimer coverings. And to do that, we have to measure the so-called uh, X uh, 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 um, uh, uh, string operator of, of the agonal string operator. And you can define this X string operator as acting on one of this um, uh, link of the of the lattice, which basically flips, you know, this uh, kind of dimers uh, around, you know, one uh, triangle. And the reason, in particular, why it's, it can be defined uh, uh, this way is that if you basically draw the closed string, what you see is that this closed string will basically couple these different dimer coverings to an other dimer coverings, and effectively this you know, entire uh, operator on the closed string acts pretty much like the sigma x acting on a single qubit. And, you know, if you want to show that you created a coherent superposition of the qubit, you basically, you know, just need to show that this expectation value of sigma x is non-zero. So basically all we need to show is that the expectation value of these closed strings is non-zero. How do we do it? It actually turns out to be quite non-trivial. So for that, we need to basically uh, uh, come up with some rotation, which converts X string into the dual zinc string, which we can measure. We can measure these strings, as I already showed. And actually, it turns out that this such a rotation exists. So here, what you need to do, you need to basically apply a collective operation of, on three atoms on each kind of triangle. And, you know, that way it turns out that you can really, you know, create an X, uh, convert an X string into the Z string. So this actually was an idea of, of Rubin, which uh, we have implemented. So we do, to do it is, you know, quite simple in quotes, you know, all what you need to do, you need to change a blockade radius. And, you know, basically this blockade radius is, is changed in, in practice by increasing the laser intensity by a factor of 200, you know, it's easier said than done. But nevertheless, you know, with this approach, what we see indeed after a right time of, of duration, we indeed see this kind of parity first collapses and then revives. And this revival is exactly at the time when the Z string is converted into the X string. So using this approach, we measure this X string operators again, finding that, you know, this is non-zero across a large fraction of the area. So this is very good. So we see some signature that we have this kind of dimer, you know, coherence of dimer coverings, but how can we distinguish, you know, for example, trivial state from like a topological state? For that, what we need to do is we need to compare closed strings, uh, closed loops versus open strings. So for example, you've seen already this kind of, uh, you know, picture where we look at a Z uh, loop, you know, where, we kind of, when we enter the, the phase, you know, it, you know, we pick up non-zero value. But if you look, for example, at the uh, open string, you know, and you kind of normalize them properly, they basically coincide in a trivial phase. But then in this kind of, in this uh, spin liquid phase, the open Z string, the value is exactly zero. Likewise, for the X string, you know, this X strings coincides, you know, open and closed loop on the disordered phase. When you enter the spin liquid phase, this X string just goes to zero. And you can actually quantify it, you know, you much more formally by introducing the so-called string order parameter. So maybe I don't have time to really talk about it, but basically it just looks at normalized values of this kind of open versus closed um, uh, string. And that way you can, for example, distinguish trivial phase from spin liquid from valence bond stand and actually, by using that kind of approach, we really quite conservatively can nail down the region of this quantum spin liquid, you know, uh, the state with real quantum spin liquid uh, uh, properties. So we basically can show that we are in a dimer phase and coherent superposition. We can also exclude this, this uh, trivial phases. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Can we conclude from this that, that you know the ground state of this model is 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 topological because you know you you are diabetically changing into this ground state uh, into yeah. this uh, Newtonian and you know <laughs> you might be getting to some 
or competing well, phase. Uh, so, okay, so what we can conclude from that is that the state we prepare has a spin liquid properties. We don't know whether it's a ground state or not. If we prepare, you know, experimentally, if we go slower, they are fair more adiabatic, the straight preparation improves, correlation properties improve, but again, we don't know whether it's a ground state or not. And I'll make a remark about it in just a second. So you just give me a minute. But okay, so of course, you know, once we have done that, you know, it's very tempting to try to, for example, build a simple topological qubit, you know, and um, you know, uh, the way how to do it, you just make a little hole in the system, it changes the topology, it becomes like a donut, right? So actually what turns out that this hole basically, you know, breaks the entire system into two distinct topological sectors. So one is a sector where you basically can take, you know, these dimer coverings and convert them into each other with the local moves like here. But, but you know, there, are, there is another sector where you have to, you cannot do it. You really have to basically, you know, um, uh, kind of make a move around this hole. And even for the very small hole, it turns out that to basically flip from kind of state from one sector to another, it requires, you know, very high order, like, I don't know, it's, you know, kind of more than 10 order kind of perturbation theory, you know, to just go from one state to another. And actually these two kind of topological sectors um, are really distinguished. For example, if you look at a string from the um, hole to the boundary, you know, it's, you know, the value for one sector is negative, value for another sector is positive. Uh, but, you know, of course, they're all, you know, in the finish sector, they are, all of them are correlated and so on. And, you know, what actually in our experiment, we will, you know, so we have two degenerate, should have two degenerate ground state, and we actually should prepare <coughs> in our diabetic procedure, this state, this plus state, the superposition. And to actually show that it's a superposition, what we need to do, we need to measure an X operator. In this case, we can actually define an X operator going around this hole, which basically, you know, sometimes is called a logical, you know, op operator, which actually uh, does not commute with the Z operator, which goes from the hole to the boundary, which is basically a kind of a logical Z in this kind of uh, representation of qubit. Okay, so basically, you know, what we do is we just follow exactly the same protocol and what we find is in the domain of the spin liquid, indeed, we prepare the state which has non-zero expectation value for the sigma x logical. The sigma z here basically vanishes and um, indeed, but at the same time, if we look, for example, at correlations of z strings from uh, hole to the boundary, we see that this, you know, the product of this correlation is, is, is non-zero. So basically what, you know, uh, we conclude is we prepare the state, which at least has some overlap with this kind of logical um, uh, uh, psi plus uh, state, but, you know, of course this overlap is not, you know, perfect. So it's kind of a step towards topological qubit, but, you know, okay, I mean, it's, you know, there is a lot of work to be done. So. I think I really used up my time. So maybe I will kind of skip this for the discussion session. So, so there is a specific question now, is it a ground state or not? You know, we actually believe that it's probably not. Uh, and this is uh, due to the following. So if you start doing like state of the art DMRG, it turns out that, you know, if you kind of just keep few, you know, nearest neighbor interaction, you know, you end up with the spin liquid in the right domain of parameters, but if you keep increasing, you know, you create, you know, longer and longer in interactions and eventually the state is destabilized. And um, at the same time, you know, if you do basically, if you try to, you know, use this quasi-adiabatic protocol, you know, and you, of course, in that case, you have to use simulations on a smaller system sizes. So, so this is also kind of time dependent, you know, matrix product type uh, 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 simulations. What uh, you find is actually you find a very good agreement with the uh, with the experiment. So indeed, there is this kind of a regime that you are enter, which has really a good spin liquid correlations, um, uh, and you know basically based on that we conclude that what we prepare is really a metastable spin liquid state, which is kind of similar to atomic uh, Bose condensate. So if for atomic Bose condensate, the ground state is solid, right, and it's not a, a state that you know, 
one typically you know, prepares and uses in, in, uh, in the BEC experiment. Okay, I think I've used up my time, but let me just conclude here. So this is an image that many of you have seen. So it um, was, I think, on the cover of Scientific American, uh, like, you know, 15 years ago. I think, you know, th this artist who drew this image, you know, he must have thought that these physicists, they went crazy, you know? They kind of stuff like that, they want to do it. And then, you know, Microsoft now, you know, put like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, in doing that. So actually kind of quite remarkably, I think stuff like that can now be done, you know? And these ideas can be implemented where these kind of little, you know, threads are actually laser beams, which can create these holes and move these around. And, you know, naturally, we are really quite excited about that. And it's, um, uh, there are many opportunities for exploring these states, you know, and I think it's related to also simulating lattice gauge theories, but also testing ideas for fault tolerance and, you know, maybe using these things for kind of new insights for designing new systems. So, I think I will skip the part about optimization and I'm sorry for running late, but you know, I hope I can convince you a little bit, you know, that we are entering this age of, you know, quantum discovery. I think there is this really very cool frontier where we are starting to realize things which are very hard to simulate, you know, um, uh, numerically, which is, you know, very hard to realize in conventional uh, condensed matter uh, systems. But, you know, when you start, looking at things like quantum scars or spin liquids, which you can literally touch, you know, and kind of explore, I think something very, very special will happen. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and, you know, thank all of these people whose blood and sweat resulted in this work. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Misha. Uh, so uh, let's have uh, questions. I can start off. Uh, the question. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, the Google also uh, implemented uh, basically similar phase uh, in, in, in a superconducting setup. So, so you think there are, you know, the atomic route is more advantageous, uh, has more yes. advantages trying to realize this kind of thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, you know, yes, yes, I kind of apologize. I was now a little bit in the rush in the last, so I should have mentioned this Google work. There is, however, I would say qualitative difference. So in this Google work, what they have done, they prepare the state. Mm -hmm. yes. they, they use the kind of a circuit and composed of C nodes, which, you know, prepare the state. So once you prepare the state, but there is, the, you know, there is no like notion of Hamiltonian or anything at this point, right? So you cannot think about the notion of topological protection, you know? Um, and, and stuff like that. I think this Google work is very cool. Actually, the, the maybe most interesting aspect of that work is that they actually measure topological entanglement entropy. So it's basically, it's a consequence. So if you have a state, which is eigenstate of these loops, which we measured, you know, it, it should have this topological entanglement entropy. So they measured it. It's okay. I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, it should have definitive value in practice, you know, there it doesn't have quite definitive value, but still I think it's very impressive, you know. And, you know, it is, you know, it's a system of, you know, 32 qubits, you know, but once again, the key and, you know, experiments like that have been done actually previously, maybe on smaller systems like Google's. Uh, I think it's still kind of very interesting route for things like um, error correction and so on. But as I said, it is notion of topological protection, you can uh, just not define. You know, you can talk about anyone's anything, but this is not like, you know, that's not the same as if you have a face, you know, and this is what we are, you know, here kind of exploring, right? Yeah. So, so what would you have to do in order to kind of improve, for example, you know, ideally you want these expectation values to be yeah. minus one or plus one. Yeah. Or yeah. So, yeah, there are maybe, there are two uh, kind of directions here, two issues, um, which are worth mentioning. So first off, the fact that our expectation values are not one, they should not be one in our case, even in the ideal case. And the reason is that, you know, so toric code is a very special 
state because it has a correlation length zero. So it's what we call fixed point state. So there, you know, it's an exactly solvable model. You see directly, you know, how these things, you know, these operators commute and so on. So in our case, this is not a, I mean, we have a finite, we have measure, we have some, you know, feeling, for example, if you look at edge effects, we see when this kind of, you know, you know, how these correlations decay. So we believe that our co correlation length in our state is something between two and three. And so, you know, what it means is even if we had a perfect, you know, like state with no anions, you know, we would need, you know, you know, like, you know, if we just measure this X and Z the way how we measure them, you know, we would still not have, you know, unity. So in what it kind of means is that the right kind of string operators are actually combinations of local sigma X and sigma Zs. And actually we are now thinking very much how we can really improve the measurement, how we can kind of given our state learn what sort of operators we have to measure. So, and this is, in, in fact, we had a paper a couple of years ago on this uh, called QCMN. We are kind of exploring this type of ideas. So that's one direction. The second, you know, uh, direction is that, you know, uh, you know, how good is the state that you prepare? So we actually know that we have, and I didn't talk about it. So we actually can measure, we can estimate the density of anions. And moreover, you know, by looking and for example, by looking at scaling, you know, with the loop sizes, you know, kind of perimeter versus area law. So we, first off, we, we know we have some anions, but we also kind of quite remarkably, we see that some, the anions which we create are correlated. Mm -hmm. So for example, our X loops, which would correspond to magnetic anions, M anions, they scale they display perfect perimeter loss scaling. So we basically, we do not create any, you know, uncorrelated M anions, you know. For, for Z anions, we see that, you know, initially there is an area loss scaling, which eventually becomes more perimeter loss scaling. So we also see some correlation. So basically the question is, first off, can we improve adiabaticity? I think we certainly can. And we have already, you know, you know seen that just, improving straightforwardly but you know maybe more interestingly can we somehow exploit these correlations between anions to maybe I mean, trap them and maybe anneal them you know that's the kind of stuff that we're thinking about yeah very interesting um i have a question so about the spin liquid state um you said that it seems to be a superposition of uh, many body states, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, in that case, I would expect that it would have a finite lifetime because of some dephasing, and that maybe this lifetime will depend on the size of the system. Did you try to see the scaling to convince yourself that indeed this is another sign of this many body entanglement? Well, so, I mean, okay, so it is, you know, kind of very, very interesting. So. But remember the historic code, I mean, it, you know, certain, so basically, so we measure some of these, you know, strings, which you have seen, you know, they involve, you know, basically product of like 20, 28 atoms. And indeed what it is, it means that we measure non-zero string, it means it's some kind of like a cat-like state, you know? So, and, you know, already the fact, you know, I mean, we know our system is imperfect. We know, you know, the fact that we can already measure some non-zero expectation value with all of this imperfection is by itself remarkable. And to me, it points out already to some kind of intrinsic robustness. So basically this, this uh, you know, in, in this topological phase, these uh, kind of observables should be at least to some extent robust to, for example, one atom, you know, flipping the face. So I think the very fact that we are able to see it already kind of signifies that we see a little bit of this robustness, but of course it's nowhere near to this fault tolerance or, or you know, or anything like this. So I guess, you know, the fact that we see these anions 
is a, um, you know, is a, is, you know, is a signature that things are not perfect, you know? And uh, I mean, you know, and like, I guess sort of my answer to the previous question is kind of in the same spirit, the answer to your question also. So, I mean, what we would like to do, we'd like to both improve the way, like, you know, that, you know, improve, you know, the observables which we measure, but also then figure out how, what to do with this kind of anions. But because eventually, you know, if you sort of, you know, a good, I mean, and, and, you know, I, one last thing I should say that, you know, we clearly see correlations across the fraction of the system size, you know, which I think is quite, quite kind of remarkable, but certainly, you know, the larger the loop, right, you know, the smaller is the signal, right? And part of that is kind of fundamental, but part is due to what you are saying, right? So we basically need to improve both. We need to, you know, in a kind of language of spin liquid, we need to reduce any on density. And, you know, we need to also figure out the better observables, which we should use, you know. Is it plausible to do, I mean, in the system, kind of active error correction? So, you know, measure and then apply corrections to annihilate anions? Yeah, that, yeah, that's kind of, you know, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, is a way of annealing, you know, right? So, yeah, in principle, you could do, you should be able to do it, yes. Yeah. I mean, given the given the time scales of the system, the measurement time and well, okay. So that you know, okay. So to do measure, you know, to do measurements and feed forward, uh, one would need to map the states to hyperfine states. So which you know, it is you know, like you know, I mean, we have done it, you know, we, you know, and other people I think have have done it. So. Uh, you know, after that, this would become, I mean, it is a little bit technical overhead, but it's, you know, this is the things we definitely, it's on our, you know, it's, it's among our plans. Yeah. And, but, you know, that, that's what I was mentioning. So, and that, but that would be a straightforward route to do error correction. So, but like there was, you know, like 10 or so years ago, there has been a very popular topic, a topic about, you know, something which is called self-correcting memories. Can you do it without this kind of stuff? And I think that's kind of maybe also an intriguing opportunity and question. You know? uh, I mean, okay. The question whether you believe that correcting those existing CD or not, or, or 3D. Well, no, no. I mean, it, I think it's very clear that, you know, in a kind of conventional, in a closed system, I mean, it has been, I think, it was proven that you need 4D, right? <laughs> But, um, but, but, for example, what if you design clever ways to anneal the annuals? You know, you need some, you need, you need some to, to, to get rid of entropy, right? And I think that might be not, I mean, you know, that might be very, very, I think this is, you know, these kind of things are quite, real, I mean, well, they're not crazy, you know? They're kind of realistic, you know? Somewhat, at least, at least to try. But, I mean, look, it's at the same time, just let me be very, very clear. I mean, it's not, you know, like, you know, I, I, I mean, I think it's very cool that you can create this topological qubit and touch it and so on. But, you know, I mean, it's like if, you know, you know, there is this kind of notion, oh, once you have this, you know, this will solve all problems of you. I mean, it's not, right? You don't, you know, I mean, it is exploratory research, right? <laughs> so. Other questions? Um, so, so I have another question. I mean, if you, if you uh, I don't know if you're in a hurry or not, but uh, so, so in, in this uh, SCAR uh, with the, uh, you know, the system where you talked about the quantum SCAR for the drive. So can, can I just, I mean, can I, you know, in a pedestrian way, think about it. Yeah. So you, you have a time crystal, but in a non many body localized system where you yeah. use the quantum SCARs to basically give you a long lifetime. Yeah. 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 That's kind of no, no. It's it's exactly so. This quantum scarce is, is this is just this kind of manifold of the states which is special, right? And uh, and you know it seems that this kind of you know in terms of these time crystals and this kind of logic time crystalline logic applies. 
with one exception, typically for time crystals, you know, you know, you want to involve all states of the system, right? Yeah. Right. So here you have a small manifold and you drive it, you know, and it, you know, once you start in this manifold, it, it somehow kind of results into this robust, you know, yields this robust trajectory. So it's kind of special, you know? So, but, but when you drive this this system, you don't expect to have a, a, a you know even in a you know a, you know ideal system, you don't expect to have a, you know an infinitely long um, you know you don't yeah, expect right. to go on for infinitely long. It's yeah, yeah that, that, that's correct. Yes, yes, you don't you know so yeah, exactly you don't expect even Wolf you know in, in this in this kind of conventional Rydberg model you don't expect. Mm -hmm. Turns out that you can make these cars near perfect by modifying these models. So this is actually one of the papers, I think, this is one, this one Choi at all. You know, you can actually modify these cars to make them more and more perfect. But honestly, we still don't understand this fully, you know? For example, how perfect can you make, you know, them? And can you have, you know, can you have, you know, perfect cars in a system which is, you know, you, you can always construct, you know, if you sort of start from scratch, you can always design models by, with some kind of clever symmetry or something, this scars will be perfect. But if you start with the kind of natural, kind of non-integrable model, where you can have perfect scars, it's not clear yet. I think there is not, you know, people don't know the answer to this question. See, see. So, and then it's driving. But what's kind of cool about this driving, and actually I don't know whether I maybe talked again a little bit too fast. So it turns out this driving actually changes the trajectory of the system. So for example, here is a, you know, here are the, the kind of, this is a perfect anti-ferromagnetic state, and this is a state with one domain wall. Mm -hmm. And so what you see, for example, in the bare, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, signal. So this state with, um, you know, anti-ferromagnetic is of course kind of dominates, you know, and there is a little bit of this one domain wall state, but in this driven, you know, trajectory, this domain one state with domain, with one domain wall somehow becomes more and more dominant. And somehow they conspire in such a way to really suppress uh, entanglement entropy growth, you know, so that's, mm. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of phenomenological observations, but you know, uh, but maybe that's the short story is that we don't yet really have a full picture of the scars, you know, what's going on and, you know, what are the conditions, we don't know. So, what are these plots that you have above? Uh, you're going too fast. And yeah, so this is actually, this is basically, so you start here with anti-ferromagnetic state uh -huh. and you plot, you know, all population of all, you know, states in a system which have certain humming distance from uh, this anti-ferromagnetic state. And basically, you know, for a nine atom chain with symmetries and so on, so there are in, in total like something on order of 50 or 60 states. So they're all Hilbert space, all entire, that's the, the peak into the Hilbert space of this one dimensional uh, system. You know, and, and basically you see, if you look at them carefully, of course, this driven, this driven um, states, they, you know, they obviously live longer, they oscillate for a longer time before thermalizing. But also if you look carefully, you, you realize, for example, look at this, this, this guy, this, this, this uh, state with one domain wall is very heavily populated, much more heavily than in the other case. So it's kind of that kind of, it really shows you that this, you know, this trajectory is kind of different, right? So, and you think because because somehow that state is these states are dominant, they they have larger amplitudes and they prevent from yeah, they somehow tend yeah they make a system you know basically you know avoid formalization for longer time. But, yeah. Right. Okay. Can, so, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. So is there is a is there an essential difference between the 2D many body scars and the 1D because I see the theory, uh, the I mean the qualitative theory the 1D describes actually the 2D behavior or yeah so there is yeah in I we our understanding now in for bipartite lattices 
they are, you know, very similar. 1G and 2G are very similar. Um, and in fact, uh, for 2G, they appear at least theoretically uh, kind of in the ideal PXP model, they appear a bit more robust even than in 1G. So, and uh, so if you have kind of a bipartite, you know, that is an infinite dimension, you, it, you can also show, I mean, it's kind of an artificial construct, but you can actually show that they almost become like classical, right? An infinite dimensional system. But the nice thing experimentally for 2D, you can explore this variety of different lattice geometries. You can really study what causes the decay and so on. And I didn't have time to talk about that, but we studied in this hour. In our paper, we, we looked at that. And there is also, it looks like there is some kind of universal phenomenological model for decay, you know, uh, of this. Yeah. In, in the 2D, you have, uh, you, you cannot do numerics, right? I mean, there's no MPS or, or there yeah, is. That's, the, that's also interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to do. Yeah. Hard to do numerics. Yeah. But they are, you know, but it appears in bipartite lattices, they are very, they are very robust and very prominent in 2D. Basically all, all bipartite lattices we try, they have to some extent displayed these curves. Any other questions? Okay, so Misha, thanks a lot for, for you know, sticking out for, uh, I think oh, thank you for, for, for being a little bit slow today. So. No, it was, I think, a phenomenal yes. talk. Uh, I, I think it was pretty great. And uh, yeah, thanks for answering all the questions. Well, thank you, guys. It's great to see you all. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, hope to see you soon in person. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay bye. Thank you. Great, great to see you. I feel also. See you guys. Bye.